Greetings Metalheads, welcome to another edition of the Friday 13th YouTube channel. Today on the 22nd of January 2022 I had the opportunity to interview Vivian Lalou from the band Lalou, a great progressive metal band, rock band from France who have just recently released their new album on Frontier Records called Paint the Sky which is an absolute amazing album. If you haven't heard it please go and check it out and go and buy it, it only got released a couple of days ago. So we spoke to Vivian and we talked about their first two albums, Organic Metal and also Atomic Arc, which are two fantastic albums. Now the first album, Organic Metal, came out on Line Music. The second album, Atomic Arc, was released on Serenity Laser Records. So you really need to check this out, they're really two good albums. So we spoke about the album, the new album Paint the Sky, which is a great album like I said. And we also talked about other things. He's done a lot of projects, so you really need to check out this interview. Um, it's going to be broken up into two parts because it was over an hour long, the interview, in-depth interview, which was fantastic. So have a watch. Let me know what you think. Thumbs up. Please share on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and any other social media sites. Also share on Facebook in groups. So thanks for watching, guys. Be safe. And uh, I'll speak to you all soon. Stay metal. Cheers. Vivian, welcome to Friday the 13th. How are you? Very well, even if um, <laughs> I actually have COVID right now. Um, COVID hit home uh, some days before, and um, but it, it, it's it's a light form. It's not. Uh, I, I'm not dying in bed like uh, a flu or anything like this. So, uh, but my my voice, you can hear it, is a little damaged. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm bound home for well, some days far away. Well, keep safe anyway. Thank you for doing this interview. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to talk about your band, Lalu. But you've, mm. first of all, I'm going to ask you how you got into music. At what age did you start playing the piano? And was piano your first instrument? Well, um, I started, I guess, even before being born, because my mother was a keyboard player in the progressive band of my dad in the 70s. And uh, while I was in the womb, she was... Uh, playing uh, Moog on stage, covering songs of Yes and Kansas. So I guess, I, I don't know if there's anything like it, but I guess there was a prenatal uh, influence. And then um, the earliest memories uh, I have of my life is uh, sitting on the laps, on the lap of the drummer at Rear Soul, uh, playing on the Moog of my mother in the living room. So, I mean, uh, as soon as I could walk, I was already playing music and uh, keyboard, but n not piano. I'm not a uh, piano trained. I, I cannot play classical pieces from Mozart or Debussy or anything like it, but uh, I, I, I'm totally a keyboard player. Right. OK, so who inspired mm. you? Which keyboard players? Uh, was it rock music that came first or um, was it something else? Obviously, Rick Wakeman at first, big influence. And then later on, uh, Jens Johansson, Jordan Rudess, Derek Sherinian, all the big names uh, in keyboards, they all have something special, you know, their own sound and signature. And um, I also love Vangelis, he's one of my biggest influences. I, I love uh, atmospheres, landscapes, and uh, I, I love the work of Vangelis. Uh, right. I, I would say these are my major inspirations. Right, okay then. So, um, is, how did you get into rock music? What was the first sort of rock band you listened to growing up? Um, it was <coughs> probably, <laughs> sorry. It's okay. Uh, y yes, Genesis, uh, Kansas, you know, all the, the big bands of the 70s. Uh, until uh, the moment I went to college and then uh, and high school, you know, I, I've heard a lot of Iron Maiden, uh, uh, mega death, you know, I started to listen some uh, heavy metal music. And um, when I was 15 years old, I, I got for my birthday a present from a friend, Images and Words from Dream Theater. And it was like a shock because I grew up with progressive music. Then later on, when I went at school, I, I, I learned heavy metal. And then suddenly there was this band who was making a, a blend of both, you know, uh, the, the progressive side and the heavy side. And uh, one of the best illustrations of that is uh, Under a Glass Moon. It's a song that um, that changed a lot of things for me. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, Dream Theater changed a lot of uh, 
people's perspective on mm. rock and metal. When they came together, everybody wanted to sound like Dream Theater because of their success. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, that that's mostly my story. Right then, so what other sort of progressive rock and metal bands did you grow up with? What sort of metal progressive bands was there besides Dream Theater? Uh, Shadow Gallery, Pain of Salvation, uh, Vanden Blast, uh, Symphony X, you know, all the big bands uh, of the 90s. Um, I, also, I also love Spock's Beer, the, the Flower Kings. I mean, I, I love progressive metal, but also progressive rock, you know, and even Neoprog, Marillion, of course, Pen Dragon. Um, yeah. So, so many acts, for example, from Sweden, Ritual, um, some um, lesser known uh, bands, you know, but who are fantastic nonetheless. Um, I, I just love good music, actually. It's, n it's not even a matter of style or genre. I, I, for me, a good song is a good song, whatever uh, its uh, style. So I also love pop music. I listen to a lot of uh, Sting, David Bowie, and uh, so I mean, it's it's so so much. There is so much to listen to outside of progressive rock and uh, metal. Even if for myself, I love to write progressive music. Yeah, you can definitely tell in your music that there's various styles of music, like you just said, the mm. Sting and everybody. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. I think. Uh, if I was limiting myself to one style, first of all, I couldn't be a composer or I would be maybe a writer limited to metal music or to something specific, which is really bad. And especially if you make progressive music, it has so much influence from so many different genres like uh, jazz, um, even um, Latino music, uh, classical music. Uh, you got to have a broad scope and be able to write and like all types of music, I think. Yeah, what do you think of Psychotic Walls, these guys? Do you have, oh. you heard, them? have you heard them? Who? Psychotic Walls. Oh, uh, no, no, that, but I see it on your T-shirt right now. Oh, I heard man. the name. And it's funny because uh, somebody told me one day, uh, I don't know f for which one of my previous albums that it had some uh, psychotic, psychotic Walls uh, vibes, and I <laughs> have never heard the band. Wow, I, I should have... probably give it a spin. <laughs> I will have to send you a link on Facebook okay. so you can check them out, definitely. So, um, can you remember the very first rock or progressive band you got into? What, what was the first band you started playing in? What age? Yes, yes. It's it's really, uh, yes, it's my biggest influence and such a big influence that it's almost religion to me. <laughs> so what, what, was the uh, first, what was the first band you was you played in when you, when you started playing oh. an instrument? Uh, it was um, at high school. I was at the art school. I actually didn't make a, a music school. I, I went to graphic arts and I was painting at the time. And uh, in that school, um, other, um, I mean, I had some uh, classmates who had a band, Doom, a uh, black metal kind of band, and they were looking for a keyboard player. So as funny as it sounds, <laughs> it started actually in a in a black metal doom uh, kind of band. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, that was a band from uh, high school, you know. And then after uh, discovering uh, Images and Words, like I told you, I, um, I, uh, I kind of left with the guitar player to make a progressive metal band, um, which was called Minds or Chard. And I still have a demo somewhere. I think we made a three title demo or something. You should put it up on YouTube. You should put yeah, it on yeah, YouTube so I can listen more. to it. Pretty yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it's it's pretty old. I mean, it's a demo from the late 90s. So, uh, yeah. Put it on there. But I mean, I you, like, like you said, you was in a black metal band. Did you wear the corpse paint? Was that one of your, <laughs> your things on yeah. stage? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, I was actually playing also guitar at the time. And indeed, I had... Um, uh, sometimes uh, paint on my face and uh, I made a trash uh, metal album myself. Uh, I mean, not really an album. It was a um, kind of an EP thing uh, with three titles. And it was really trashy, like an instrumental version of Megadeth, but it's really old. Nobody's uh, would be interested to hear that, I guess. Oh, you, um, nev you never know, Vivian. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean... Yeah. So I mean, when you when you started like playing in bands, I mean, what was the first recording band that you did that you had to record an album? Was it Lalu or was it the other band that you was in on? No, it was uh, Ubi Meisel, the first singer of this uh, progressive metal band from Germany called Dreamscape. 
Uh, I know those guys, I yeah. I used to know Hubby. Yeah. I used to be friends with Hubby. Yeah, so you probably know that Hubby hired me to write albums for him. And that's how I ended up writing Emotion and Kailash. And uh, I composed the, the music, you know, according to his direction. He made kind of a document with a story and he kind of guided me, um, you know, telling me that on this part, something happens to the main character and then he goes to this place and the music has to reflect a, a specific vibe. And I, have, I had to follow his guidelines. And that's basically how I wrote Emotion and uh, Kailash. So that was and, the album that was released uh, on Lion Records. I Lion Music, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it was really a, 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 a big start for me because that, that's when some people started to, to hear my name and, uh, and start to send me messages and follow me. And uh, yeah, it was really cool. All right. So what, what, what came after that then, after the Hubby album? Was it the Chandra, Chandra album um, that you did? Uh, yeah, I started to work on that. But first I made uh, Oniric Metal, the, the first Lalu record. Um, because the thing is that I was working for Ubi and composing all the time with the limitation, you know, of these documents and everything. And after a while, I was thinking like uh, I could do the same thing uh, for myself, right? Too, I, I could uh, start my own uh, kind of band or solo project, and uh, that's how it happened basically. And um, <laughs> It came out really fine. Um, it was a very special time because at the time I was studying at the university in the early 2000s and I produced Oniric Metal entirely by myself uh, at home. And um, you, you can imagine the computers we had back in the day. <laughs> so it was kind of a challenge, but uh, it's fine. I mean, so, there are a lot of artists who did like this. I think Devin Townsend, for example, made the uh, Ocean Machine uh, in a hotel room in Spain, or I heard some stories. I mean, it happens to all of us when we start. <laughs> it's a fantastic album, the first album, Lalo. I really like mm. it. It's very ah, different. You mean, uh, Oniric Metal? Yeah, it's a brilliant album. Mm. It's like a, for a Thank debut so album. Much. It's like, I remember re reviewing it for you many years ago. For ah, the, okay. Yeah, I did the album review for you many, many years ago. Ah, I should read that. Yeah, it's I, on the, it's on the website. Yeah, oh, okay. I, yeah. I, I have to go to have a look. Yeah, thank you so much. You, like, you okay. really grew up with like the Asian sound. Yeah, yeah. There is actually a breakdown part in the last uh, track titled uh, The Final Fantasy, where indeed I'm using a lot of uh, Asian sounds, as I did for Ruby Meisel in the Kailash album, because Kailash was a uh, concept album about Tibet. And... Uh, I, I love this type of vibe. I mean, I'm a big fan of Peter Gabriel, work, world music, and um, I love to add uh, these little Asian bells and uh, vibes everywhere. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, that band, I I was that. Telling you, that band I was telling you about were called Tears of Anger. They had the two albums on Nine Music. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I think I remember Tears of Anger now that you say it. I think it was uh, Daniel Flores on drums. Yeah, and I think it, it was Bjorn uh, Janssen yeah. Yeah, yeah. on vocals. Yes, yeah. exactly. You know, he could, have been, stuff. Yeah, he could have been a really, really good singer for your band. Because he's not, oh, doing, for, he's not, do, he's I, not I, doing anything now. Yeah, yeah. I, I've done some songs with him on uh, Shannon. And he's also a very down-to-earth and uh, cool uh, person. I, I like him a lot, yeah. So from the first album, Organic Metal album, what's your favourite songs and why? Um, I love the, open, the opener, Yesterday Man. Um, because it has uh, this kind of uh, escapism uh, vibe. It's like you are um, basically the character is done with um, with his life uh, in in the human society in the city. He's living for an island, and it's like uh, it has um, how to say some vibes like the. I don't know if you ever seen the music video of Honor of Lonely Heart by Yes. Um, no, I when uh, this guy is walking in the city with his uh, business suit and he doesn't fit anymore in the landscape. And it's, it's about uh, escaping uh, the, the current world we're in this society and going to live alone on a far remote island. And I, I just like the, the vibe of the song. Uh, and the voice of Martin on it is uh, really clear, it's beautiful. I, I think it's one of his best recordings ever. And um, I like a lot uh, Windy for the, the nice uh, vibes. It reminds me a lot of a Stevie Vai. Uh, 
I like Time Stop. Uh, also the, um, the the closing track, uh, the Final Fantasy. Uh, but uh, I mostly don't listen to it anymore. You know, I am I am very harsh with my uh, past uh, recordings. Uh, I've heard them so much, and I hear so many things that I would like to change, or I have made so much mistake that it prevents me from uh, enjoying it. You know, I hear something and I'm like, oh, why did I do this like this? And uh, why did I mix it and produce it by myself? It could have been so great if I uh, did this like this or like that. And uh, so basically, I'm just giving up. <laughs> I'm, I'm not listening to these records. It's but, very, um, very, exp it's very hard to get hold of that album. It's quite, quite difficult mm. to get. It's very expensive on eBay. Ah, really? Yeah, mm. yeah, it's not, it's not. It's one of these albums Maybe. that's quite, quite expensive. Yeah, maybe because the Lion Music version is uh, is out of stock or something. But uh, I brought the album back online um, on uh, Bandcamp, Spotify, Apple Music, all the platforms. And uh, who knows if one day uh, a label wants to buy my catalog, uh, you know, they, they can have it. And uh, for now, it will have to be digital because myself, I don't have any copies left. You know, I have just one copy, I think, uh, remaining. So how did how did you get the lineup for the first album? How did you find Martin and uh, everybody? I remember that I, I actually auditioned for the band of Martin, which at the time had uh, Alex Landenberg on drums, who is currently the drummer of uh, Camelot. And uh, back in the day, um, uh, I was speaking with uh, Alex via messages. And uh, he wanted me to audition for keyboards because they were looking for a keyboard player. So I made an audition. It was the name of the band was Broken Glass. It was before Martin uh, was in, inside Tomorrow's Eve. And uh, they loved it. Everything was nice and beautiful. And uh, at the moment we should have started, they just disbanded. <laughs> they simply disbanded. So the band was not a thing anymore. And I just had this idea to create my own thing. And I spoke with um, Alex and uh, I, I asked him if it would be okay for him if I borrow his friend uh, uh, for vocals. And he, he got me in touch with Martin. And that's how I started uh, working with Martin, sending him some uh, material. You know, I was composing music, sending that to him. And he was uh, writing vocal lines, lyrics, and so on. So, yeah, that's how it started. And then I was such a fan, like I mentioned before, of uh, Devin Townsend that obviously I loved so, so much the drummer of Devin Townsend at the time. I contacted this drummer and he loved the demos and say, yeah, yeah, I, I will play on the, the record. And then he, because I also needed the bass player, it was Ryan, uh, the drummer who um, who brought uh, Russell Bergquist. Inside, yeah, he used to be an uh, annihilator. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this was all through Ryan. It was Ryan von Puderuyen who, who who uh, put me in touch with Russell. And uh, I have very uh, good memories of making this album, even if I never listen to it anymore. It's uh, memories of me at the, the, the sixth floor of my old Parisian building uh, without uh, any lift. I had to climb them the stairs, you know, sixth floor. And uh, I was staying there hours and making my record. And it's just um, a crazy time. I have fond memories of making it. So where did you find the guitarist, Yop? Where did you find him? Ah, uh, I found Yop uh, before. It was in 2000, at the end of 2001, beginning of 2002. Uh, I found him from a website because, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, bands had a lot of links on their website to other bands. It's something that we don't see much anymore today. But back in the day, you were going to a band and you had links to other bands or friends of that band. And I discovered Arabesque that way, uh, his band back in the day. And from the first guitar riff that I heard when I entered on the website, he had an amazing guitar riff uh, starting a song. And instantly, like hearing five seconds of it, I knew that I wanted to ask him to play on the on the album. And I wasn't wrong. I mean, I even went, I, I paid some train tickets. I went to his house in the Netherlands. And when I saw him play, it was just uh, mind blowing. I mean, uh, for, he's my favorite guitar player. He's, uh, he's out of this world, really. A lot of people don't know him, but even Stevie Vai favorited his uh, cover of uh, Die to Live For in the beginnings of YouTube when Dupe uh, covered his song. And he's such a genius. And uh, I actually hope, I, I mean, he has um, released a lot of albums uh, already. 
Um, but yeah. I hope that the Pain the Sky album will allow people to discover uh, another side of him, especially his bass playing, which is also out of this world. I mean, he does a lot of instrumental albums, doesn't he? Mm, oh yes, yes, yes. And uh, but <clears throat> recently, his last uh, record, uh, titled Snapshot, features uh, vocals. Uh, some of the songs have vocals, uh, some of the songs are instrumental. He's a great composer. And um, I don't know if you are aware, but I also have a, a new band um, with uh, Realder of the Fates Warning and Mark Zonder. Oh, wow. Uh, called A to Z. I know, um, right? He's a friend of Mark and Ray Noma. Tell him I said hello. Oh, okay. Fine. <laughs> I will. And uh, they asked me to, to join them, you know. Uh, Mark uh, created this new band, and uh, I, I was lucky to be asked, uh, you know, to write uh, songs and play the keyboards, and uh, and so uh, Jupe is also. Uh, I mean, I brought Jupe in naturally because they were looking for a guitar player, and I said, you know what, the best I know is uh, Jupe. Uh, come on, let's just <laughs> take Jupe with us, and uh, and he happened to have, I think, written the best songs on that album. It will be released later this year. Just check it out. Wow. I think uh, the song Jupe has written are out of this world. He's such a good composer on top of uh, guitar player. So how does this this project or band differ from Fate's Warning? Is it completely different to what Ray and Mark's done in the past? Ah, uh, yeah, it's um, a, a Truzy is like it has some progressive sides. I mean, there are one or two songs which sounds like what I'd done for Ubi Meisel, but with Ray Alder on vocals, you know, and some of the other songs, they are... Uh, more melodic, you know, um, heavier. Uh, some of them sound a little like uh, EVH, uh, you know, Eddie Van Halen. Um, it's like um, 80s uh, kind of record, but made today um, with a uh, proggy edge, you know. Uh, I, I cannot describe it. but uh, I'm looking forward to hearing I, it. I, mean... I, 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 I think personally it will bring me more than the... Lalu album than Paint the Sky in terms of recognition. I think some of the best songs we worked on are on this one. But again, it's not progressive. My my my, my soul, my mind is into progressive music. That's what I love to to make. So uh, obviously for me, uh, Lalu is very important, but it's also a good one, uh, A to Z. So yeah. what what label is going to release this Ray Alder, uh, Max? Oh, it? it's it's a metal metal blade. Metal blade. Well, could he, yeah. could, just could, just before we talk about the next album that Lalo's done, a Fate's Warning broke up because everybody's thinking that the band have broken up. Do you know anything about this? Are they going to carry on? Or... No, I think they are carrying on. I, I didn't hear anything like that. And I think last time I checked, they were still listed uh, like current on the Metal Blade roster. So I think, uh, yeah, they're, they're, I think they are still together. Good. That's one of my favorite bands. Ray's got an amazing voice. Ah, uh, yeah. And he's a great guy. I mean, yeah. uh, it was a pleasure to to work with him uh, on the A to Z album and do with him the same I was doing with Ubi, you know, write, writing music. And then he was writing on vocal lines and showing those lines to us. And of, obviously, when Realder sends you uh, vocal lines and ideas on a, on a song ID, on a draft that you made, it instantly sounds like a finished product. It's incredible. I can't explain. It's true what people say. You could really sing the, the phone book, you know. Yeah, brilliant. So why yeah. why did you only do one album with Lion Music for the first album? Why was it just mm? one album? Why did you only do one album um, with Lion? I uh, I made one album on Lion, and then I made a second one for this other project you mentioned, uh, Shadrain. Uh, and it's a great one... album. That's a really good album. That that's uh, got you lot... like it. The... Yeah, it's got Temple. a lot. Of, it's got a lot of very Eastern music in it, like mm. Eastern Asian again. Ah. You, you like that keyboard mm. sound, don't you, for the Asian sound? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this album uh, was not such a good memory because I had so much troubles uh, producing it. Uh, I also made a mistake to produce it by myself, you know. It was um, after uh, making Oniric. And the, the problem is that when I finished the record, there was this big storm and thunder and Basically, the, the PC of the studio burned, like the, the unit started to take fire, it wow. was fumes and stuff. And um, the hard drive crashed. I had no backup. Ouch. And uh, some of the images and files, I could still open them and some were uh, some kind of a corrupted. So 
outside of the, the recordings of the guests, which I had on a CDR format, I had to remake everything from scratch, the whole album, the whole production. And it, it felt horrible. Um, honestly, when you hear the, the album, what you hear is the second re-recording of uh, everything outside of the guest parts, of course. But uh, we had so much problems. And then when I received uh, the drums of the drummer, Greg Bissonnet, um, there was also a damaged file. Uh, the, the overhead the signal was damaged, so it was difficult to, to mix it. And they couldn't re-record, you know, uh, unless to be paid again, just a mess. Uh, I, it's a shame because um, I really love the, the, the compositions, but um, yeah, I was really unlucky uh, with, that, with this one. Brilliant album. It's just a shame you never did a second album. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Everybody is asking me about it. Uh, there are a lot of people who like uh, Temporal. And I, I, I'm not saying that I won't do, th do this again. You know, I, I would gladly make a new one. And uh, especially with uh, Henrik, for example, Henrik Bath on uh, vocals. Um, and Dupe, obviously, because Shadrain is Dupe and me, of course. Um, and uh, we actually have some ideas about it, but uh, now it's not the time yet. And uh, I would have, you know, to produce a demo and show it to Frontiers and see if they are interested because now they are my label yeah. and they have an exclusivity contract with them. So whatever I do, uh, I have to submit it to them. And uh, yeah. Make sure you back up the tapes this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've learned from that. You can't imagine. When I made uh, Pen the Sky, I. I've made so much backups. It was really a big, uh, you know, uh, I, I learned a big lesson that time. Yeah, yeah. This, like the second album, we're going to talk about Atomic Arc. What a fantastic mm. album. That is such a great album. Thank you so much. Every, yeah. every, I mean, you've got some fantastic musicians on there. You've got Mike Lapond, mm. who was a friend of mine. You've got uh, mm. Virgil from Planet X, who's also in Ring of Fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've got, mm. uh, you know, it's Martin again. It's a great album. Just tell me a little bit about that album. Was It, it must have been yeah. a success. Yeah, thank you so much. I remember first I, I worked the demos with uh, Simone, the guitar player, because yeah. at the time I started working on Atomic Arc, uh, Jupe wanted to work on his uh, solo albums, and it's normal, you know, he wanted to concentrate on his uh, own uh, gigs and uh, um, guitar album and instrumental music. So um, I, I asked uh, Simone, uh, and we made the demos of the, the record together with Martin on vocals. And then it was kind of a natural process because uh, when I went to Ryan again, who drummed on, uh, on Eric Metal, this time he was busy touring like for two years. I was waiting after him. He was touring with Devin nonstop. Like he had no chance to, <laughs> to sit down uh, for, for four days. It was two years of nonstop touring, which is completely crazy considering what happens today. Uh, back in those times, it was uh, uh, really different. And so I ended up asking Virgil because I knew Virgil from a long time ago, um, from 2003, I think. Uh, we've been friends uh, for a long time and uh, uh, played on some records together. And he was the logical choice uh, for me because I, anyway, I always wanted to, to do something with him. So um, it was kind of natural. And uh, he's still uh, one of my closest friends to this day. We speak Fantas uh, a lot together. Drummer. Fantastic yeah, yeah, fantastic and and great human being. I want to say because uh, obviously people uh, don't have a chance to know, but he's also a very down to earth uh, person, a very interesting artist. He has uh, such a great mind. It's uh, it's so inspiring to speak with him. Yeah. So how how did you hook up with Mike Lapon from Symphony X? Um, I think I contacted him back in the day uh, on MySpace. I think it was the times of MySpace. Yeah, those uh, days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it was uh, it was all fine. He liked the the music and everything. It was really smooth, you know. And uh, yeah, I ended up uh, having an album with uh, Mike Lipond of one of my favorite bands, uh, Symphony X, of course. And uh, Virgil and the guys, yeah, it was um, a beautiful time. Man. And uh, this time, when I made Atomic Arc, I decided to, because like I told you, I learned my lesson after uh, Shadrain, I decided to ask uh, a producer, a sound engineer, to mix the album. Uh, so uh, I would sit at the studio every day with uh, Jan Mimi, 
who is uh, one of uh, France's best sound engineers. I mean, the top 10 here on iTunes is mixed by him. Um, and he also worked on some uh, Bruce Dickinson uh, records. He engineered uh, an album with Ronnie James Dio. So he was also familiar with uh, metal music. So uh, that's why Atomic Arc sounds so good compared to the previous album. I mean, there is a nice balance uh, in the mix. You can uh, play it uh, anywhere on any system. It always sounds great. So, and I'm really happy about this decision. So how did you get hold of Simone? Because obviously he's with DGM and he does a lot of producing himself. Oh, yeah. Actually, I was talking with him uh, for some years already. Uh, you know, back in the day, everything, everybody was talking with uh, Microsoft Messenger. Everybody was talking together and MySpace and we were friends and exchanging some music and stuff. So uh, we worked mostly like that, you know, sending each other uh, the files and he would record some riffs uh, that I, uh, I made on keyboard, you know, because when I write songs, I do everything myself, even the guitar riffs. I, it's like... Uh, I am, <laughs> I'm writing everything and then I'm sending it over and then those guys are playing the parts, you know, and uh, Simone was amazing because I could send him a song and he would send it back and it would soon just like uh, Symphony X, you know, like uh, huge. I mean, you hear his guitars on Atomic Arca, so heavy and unreal. Uh, yeah, sort of like, yeah. like Mike, Mon Mike Romeo from Symphony X has got the same yeah, sort of yeah, guitar. Yeah, it's one of his biggest influences too. Huh? Right then, he also so, loves David Townsend. So, uh, so how did you hook up with Ken from Serenity mm -hmm. Records? Because Ken obviously released bands like Zero ah, from like... The Lazar's Edge. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's because <clears throat> back in the day, I was asking. At this time, it was Facebook. We transitioned over in the meanwhile to to Facebook from MySpace to Facebook, and I was asking some friends there if they knew somebody who was serious and reliable, you know, about releasing an album. And uh, it's a common friend who got us in touch, and Ken liked the. Uh, the, the album, you know, and uh, he sent a contract. And uh, that's uh, what happened, really. It was uh, pretty uh, easy. And uh, yeah, I think they did a good job. And I could even tour in those times. We went yeah. uh, to promote uh, Atomic Arc Live. And uh, we even headlined a couple of festivals in Europe. It was really cool. And um, yeah. Was it was one also of the, a different time. <laughs> was one of the festivals Prog Power in Europe? Uh, no, no, no. It was Headway, Headway Festival. Yeah, I've heard of and that then, uh, Yeah, yeah. And then uh, a yeah, great festival in the Netherlands. And uh, actually, uh, we were not supposed to headline in the beginning. I told you before, I was a fan of the band uh, called ACT, ACT. And um, ACT couldn't come finally, so we've been the... <laughs> You know, we jumped at the headline. Uh, headline Which band position. was this, Vivian? Which band? Viv was it Arc? Act? Act, 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 yeah. Oh, ACT, right, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so what songs from the album Atomic Arc do you like and why? Because, I mean, that is like every song on the uh, album oh, is brilliant. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I think it's a very heavy and dark album. It, it's mm. not, um, it's very particular. Not everybody... Uh, would enjoy it. I mean, Paint the Sky is more upbeat, you know, it has a lot of positive vibes and Atomic Arc was just all the opposite. Um, so uh, I really like Momento. Speaking of Asian vibes, uh, Momento has a lot of Asian vibes. I like uh, Follow the Line, which, ha which, which was inspired by Gentle Giant. And it was my first experiment, actually, um, taking this uh, 70s uh, type of um, ideas, but giving it a modern edge, you know, a heavier uh, coating. Uh, I, I think that it started with that particular song. It's like a nice uh, precursor to paint the sky. Uh, yeah, follow the line. Uh, a lot of people uh, love Revelations. I know that when we were touring, uh, Virgil told me that um, Revelations He's uh, really uh, what I should be doing, you know, in the future. He loved the cinematic vibe of the song, and for him, uh, it was the best one. And uh, yeah, mostly. Uh, so, how would you describe your music for people that don't know? Ah, uh, it depends, uh, because all those albums that we talked about are completely different. But I guess that uh, some f two elements remain. Is that first? I love uh, dreamy keyboards, little bells and whistles here and there. So there are a lot of uh, dreamy pads and arpeggios and uh, 
like you say, those little Asian bells and sometimes this uh, retro type of uh, keyboards um, contrasting with a uh, heavy, uh, a heavy touch on the guitars and the drums too, because the heaviness definitely comes from the drums. I mean, compared to Atomic Arc, Paint the Sky is, uh, is really crunchy, you know, it's not really heavy, it's not heavy metal, but the heaviness comes from the drums of Jelly. I think there is even a Beatles part, which is ending with a blast, uh, a black metal blast beat at the end where Jelly uh, goes crazy. And I love that because uh, that's the, the point of progressive rock is to, uh, you know, uh, go, uh, I mean, beyond, beyond the limits, ideas. beyond the limits. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there is even Damien who plays some Katsu. So <laughs> I think I would say that uh, whatever albums I have done, you cannot say that you hear two times the same song. I always want to each song to be unique. Like I said, for me, I think in terms of songs and not uh, really music style or, or album. So yeah, it's about uh, taking people on a journey and from one song to another, something happens different. Something different happens. And um, so, yeah, it's sometimes progressive, uh, sometimes heavy. Um, I, I, I couldn't really put, uh, you know, um, I, I, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, so what do you say? I mean, Simone produced this album, didn't he? The Atomic Arc album. Was it the right choice for Simone to do the album? Ah, uh, yes, he, he had to produce it, actually. Uh, sorry, my dogs are barking. Okay. Uh, Simone had to produce the record. But in the end, um, because he was too busy indeed with his own band and projects at the time, it was the moment he started to explode, really. Uh, that's why I uh, started working with uh, Jan, the, the, the French uh, audio engineer I told you. And uh, Simone helped premixing uh, as much as he could. And then uh, Jan, um, you know, uh, took everything and continued uh, the work on the record. So how well um, did the sorry sorry you were saying no 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 problem uh, I was no problem, I was just, I was just gonna say how, how well did the album sell the Atomic Arc album did it it must have sold mm, really well for you I think to... uh, a little more than uh, Oniric I think Oniric back in the day uh, sold something like three thousand copies and uh, uh, Atomic Arc uh, sold sold more but uh, I don't have numbers in mind right now I, I don't even remember but um, yeah. It's uh, it's you, you never know in advance if people will like uh, your new album or the new direction. For example, Shadrain, we were speaking about Shadrain before. It sold only 1,000 copies, you know. So, and a lot of people write me every day about this album. A lot of people love it. Yet it's it a sold great only 1,000 copies. Why? It's, it's yeah. such a, I, even I reviewed that album for you back in mm -hmm. the day, and I thought it was mm -hmm. a great album. Thank you so much. It's just, it's just, it's just one of those things. I mean, one thing I'd like to ask you: Why has it taken so long for you to release every Lalu album? Like, there's like five um, years difference. Oh, it's, it's because uh, yeah. in France I was working as a studio manager in Paris. I had artists uh, to record, um, projects to manage. You know, I was a project manager. I had music to make for French television. I've made some movies. Like, I had so much work to do uh, because prog music couldn't feed me. You know. And each time I was making an album, basically it was made uh, out of love money. You know, it means that my family uh, would uh, help me to finance it. And that's why this, uh, this new partnership with Frontiers is uh, very important for me because uh, thanks to this contract, I can now concentrate on the music and I know that I can make an album every year if I want. And this is really great. And uh, so, yeah. I, I, I will be honest with you. I am already uh, three songs uh, in the next album. I already wrote three songs. Oh, brilliant. Uh, it will be with the same lineup again with Damien, Jelly, Jupe. It's more, more like Pen the Sky. Pen the Sky is like a reboot. And uh, the next record is starting from there. You know, so you're gonna, lineup. You, you, that's brilliant. Uh, just before we talk about the new album, you did do a live CD, didn't, didn't you, for the Tommy mm -hmm. Carr album? There was a live CD yeah, yeah, you yeah, released. The, yeah, yeah. It was during the Headway Festival gig, yeah. And uh, it was also mixed by Simone. He took, um, we had a friend of Martin, a soon engineer, uh, record the show and send the, the, the files to Simone. And Simo um, produced it. And it's still up on the Bandcamp, I think. But uh, yeah. Okay, that's I mean, it. it's. Uh, 
It's a, it's a previous uh, generation Lalu music, right? It's, uh, it's still like Atomic Arc. It's the same songs as uh, Atomic and Onyek. And as you heard, uh, Pen the Sky is a different animal. Huh? 